is common in science to run replicate experiments to determine a desired physical quantity. While some details of these experiments may differ, such as the mass of the sample being studied, those differences are accounted for in the data analysis so that each replicate experiment truly gives an independent measurement of the same desired quantity. In these cases, it is tempting to just take an average of the values and call it a day. Unfortunately, when these values have different levels of uncertainty, it's not that simple. The general idea is that we want the values that are more certain to be weighted more, and the values that are less certain to be weighted less. We can do that by assigning individual weights to each value that determines how much of a contribution it makes to the average. Notice that if all the weights are 1, then this equation just becomes the normal average equation we looked at a moment ago. Naturally, we want these weights to be related to our level of uncertainty in the individual measurements. The higher the uncertainty, the lower the weight should be. The most common way to do this is to assign the weights to be the reciprocal of the variance, remembering that the variance is the square of the standard error. Plugging that in, we have a relatively straightforward expression for this weighted average. As a brief side note, what if we had already converted our uncertainty levels to something other than standard deviations, like a 95% confidence interval? Well, the conversion between the two is simply a multiplicative factor, which we can call f. Notice that the f's just cancel. This means that whatever way we have represented our uncertainty level, as long as we are consistent about it, we're fine. Okay, so what do we do in order to determine our level of uncertainty in the weighted mean we just calculated? By simple propagation of uncertainty, we can find this expression for standard error of the weighted mean. And that is what is calculated by many software packages. You will notice that this expression is contained in the expression for the weighted mean, which allows us to simplify that expression. This determination of the standard error of the weighted mean assumes that the individual measurement variances are correctly representative of the underlying probability distribution for the measurements. In practice, however, that assumption often isn't correct. Let's look at some examples. Let's suppose that the quantity we are trying to measure has a true value of 5, and our measurement uncertainty has a standard deviation of 1. This plot shows the expected distribution of measurements and 10 example measurements with their 95% confidence intervals. Notice that all but one of the measurements have the correct value of 5 within their 95% confidence interval. Also notice that all of the mutual uncertainties of these various measurements overlap, meaning that these measurements are all consistent with each other. Using the equations for weighted mean and standard error of the weighted mean, we find an average of 5.1 plus or minus 0.6. Notice that this averaging process means that we can determine the mean value to a much higher degree of certainty than we can with an individual measurement. Unfortunately, this situation assumes that we know the underlying measurement uncertainty. Let's take a look at some examples where that may not be the case. Here's an example where the data was drawn from exactly the same distribution as before, but with a lower assigned uncertainty to the individual measurements. Notice how the data points are often not within mutual uncertainty of each other, and how only four of the ten points have uncertainty levels that extend to the mean value. These are the hallmarks of the uncertainty in each measurement having been underestimated. Also notice that the uncertainty in the mean calculated using our earlier equations does not extend to the correct value of 5. On the other hand, here's an example of data also taken from the same distribution, but with much larger assigned uncertainties. The variation in data points seems to be much smaller than the given error bars. This is a hallmark of overestimated uncertainty. In both of these cases, the issue we are dealing with is that the uncertainty values we propagated do not correctly represent the uncertainty in the measurements. So we need some method for accounting for both the propagated uncertainty in the measurements and the actual scatter in the data. The solution to this problem is to correct the weighted sample variance by a quantity known as the reduced chi-squared, which is a measure of how greatly the points in the data set differ from the mean. Be sure to watch the squares in these formulas. Looking at our earlier examples, the case where we underestimated the individual point uncertainties gave us a reduced chi-square of over 11, which means that our uncertainty level is about three and a third times what we had previously thought, as shown in red. Alternately, when we look at the case where we overestimated the individual point uncertainties, we get a reduced chi-square of 0.016, which 
meaning that our uncertainty level is only a bit more than a tenth of what we had previously thought. And there we have it, formulas for the weighted mean and for the standard error of the weighted mean using variance weights and scale correction. There's one last detail to clear up, however. The development so far assumes that there is a fundamental value that we are trying to determine, and we have replicate measurements of that value. This is different from a case where we are making measurements on members of a population where we expect there to be variation within that population. Imagine measuring the heights of all the members of your class. Here you may have extremely accurate individual measurements, but a high dispersion in the data because people's heights legitimately vary. The analysis described above is not directly applicable to that type of situation.